Hello and welcome to the Dynamic Leaders Podcast, part of the Talent 409 Leadership Academy Network. I am your host, Colin Cernelia, and thank you so much for joining us today. Please head over to talent409.com to learn more about how we can help your team or organization with their leadership and culture development. This podcast is available on Spotify, YouTube, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, and wherever else you listen to your favorite podcast. Plus, don't forget, you can now play this podcast on any Amazon-enabled device. Just ask, Alexa, play the Dynamic Leaders podcast. Getting Dynamic Leaders with Colin Treniglia from Apple Podcasts. Before this episode begins, please consider taking a minute and leave a rating and review. Doing this really does help us grow the show, and you can get featured for your review on a future episode. Okay, and on to my featured guest for episode 113 of the Dynamic Leaders Podcast. Today, you'll get to hear my conversation with Larissa Anderson. Larissa is the head softball coach at the University of Missouri. Before getting to Missouri, Larissa was the head coach at Hofstra University, and she also played college softball at Gannon University. Some of the topics we talk about on today's podcast include overcoming adversity that you have no control over, why great teams are disciplined, and how to achieve that, how she learns from her husband Patrick, who is a manager in the Washington Nationals minor league system, how she creates culture pyramids that get her players from me to we. Larissa talks to us about emergency plans and why her teams actually practice rain delays. That's right, they practice rain delays. How to overcome talent deficiencies and why it's good to not be afraid to admit that. Work ethic. Larissa talks consistently about work ethic throughout this entire conversation. And finally, how it's really important to know that you have complete control over your effort, concentration, and that magic word, work ethic. Get ready for an inspiring conversation. Larissa is awesome. You are going to love this. So let's not wait any longer and let's discover our talent altitude. Here is my talk with Larissa Anderson. everyone welcome back to the dynamic leaders podcast today my guest with me is larissa anderson larissa thank you so much for joining the show oh my pleasure to be here well i'm super glad to have you on larissa and i want to talk about as much as we can during our time today but first i do want to give you an opportunity to tell the listening audience a little bit about yourself so please tell us who are you Oh, Larissa Anderson. I'm currently the head softball coach at the University of Missouri, um, Mizzou, for those of you guys that follow. I just started my second season. I was at Hofstra University in Long Island, New York, in the Colonial Athletic Association for 17 years. I was an associate head coach for 13 under Hall of Fame coach Bill Edwards, and then I took over the program when he retired. I was a head coach there for four years, and then I made my way to Columbia, Missouri, and I'm excited to be here. I definitely want to spend a good chunk of our time here today talking about not just your coaching career, but what you've learned as a coach and what you can teach us, you can teach me and the listening audience here today. But I want to first understand a little bit more about how you got to this point. Was athletics and softball in particular, was that something that was always a part of your life and something you knew that you always wanted to try to continue to do as long as you could? You know, as my mom would say it, I was always a a sneakerhead. You know, I was always <laughs> running around and, and playing sports. I was a three-sport athlete in high school all growing up. I played volleyball in high school. I was a downhill ski racer, which is very, very rare uh, for those of you around the country. And, of course, I played softball. And I had no idea what I was going to do when I, when I went to college. I, I knew I was going to college, but it was just a matter of what my favorite sport was and what I was, what I was the best at. And if you were to ask me what my favorite sport was at that time, it was whatever sport, whatever season we were in. If we were in volleyball season, volleyball was my favorite sport. And then same with downhill ski racing and then to softball. And the story I tell, which really got me into fast softball and led me down the path that I am right now is when I 
was in ninth and 10th grade. I was a slingshot pitcher. I never, ever saw a fast pitch windmill pitcher until after 10th grade, I went to the New York State High School Championships and I walk on the field and there I saw my first windmill pitcher and I just stopped dead in my tracks. And it was, wow, what is she doing? (laughs) It just looked like she was throwing the ball 90 miles an hour and flying off the mound because all I knew was just really stand there, whip my arm back and throw it forward and immediately went to my high school coach. And uh, I'm originally from a very, very small town in upstate New York called Lake George very resort area, a lot of tourism. Um, but I was very sheltered and naive to the game of softball because um, I went up, went through high school in the late eighties, early nineties. So I'm dating myself here, but uh, went to my high school coach and said, I want to learn how to do that. And she found a great, great summer coach or summer camp. Uh, Karen Mullins, who was the former UConn coach. She was there. Deb Flazzi, who was at Ithaca, who's been to the, the college world series a number of times in division three. So some outstanding college coaches and, I went there for three days and learned how to fit pitch fast pitch. Uh, went back to Lake George and we ended up winning a state championship my junior year and really just fell in love with the game. And I learned how to teach pitching and I was a junkie and threw up against the side of my house and really let, led me down the path that I am now. Uh, at that camp, uh, a college player came up to me and she said, uh, you know, you're pretty good. You should play on an on a ASA travel ball team. And at the same time, it was like, ASA, what is that? <laughs> Uh, I, I had no idea. I, I commuted an hour to Albany to play on this travel ball team. And again, I knew I was going to college and uh, it was just so, you know, wouldn't it be really, really cool if I could play softball in college and found a great program in Erie, Pennsylvania, a school called Gannon University. It was a small private Catholic school, played division two ball. Again, loved the game, was, was a junkie, went to every single workout, went to pitching workouts, even though I wasn't a pitcher. Uh, in college and uh, said, you know, wouldn't it be really cool if I could coach this game the rest of my career? And um, met a guy, he was in baseball and uh, he took us to Long Island. He became an assistant softball coach at Hofstra University. Uh, We got married. He now currently is a manager in the Washington Nationals organization. I'm the head coach at University of Missouri. So, uh, you know, a long way about, but uh, fell in love with the game, fell in love with uh, a guy and led us down the path that we are now. That's so cool and such a great story. And I'm curious as to how maybe your collegiate softball experience specifically, how that lent towards you wanting to continue to be around the game because, and and I think you alluded to this a little bit, the game was so much different then than it is now. And I played baseball in the mid two thousands and baseball was so much different than it is now. And it just changes constantly. And I'm just wondering from the experience that you had in college, and it sounds like it was a good one. I mean, was there any thought about doing something outside of sports, like maybe getting into the corporate world or something like that? Or did you always know that coaching is what you want to do? And then obviously you meet your husband and you guys end up at Long Island and and move on from there. You know, it was, I I went to school to be a physical therapist. I loved helping people and overcoming athletic injuries and seeing them grow. And that's really what coaching is. Um, I just didn't know it at the time, and I didn't know I could make a profession out of it. So I went to school to get my degree in physical therapy, and I knew that was going to pay the bills, and that was going to be in rehab and orthopedic rehab, but I knew softball was always going to be a part of my life. So in my, in the back of my head, it was, you know, I could coach a travel ball team, or I could coach a high school team just to, to fulfill that need that I had inside me. And then when I realized that I actually could make some money coaching softball, and I could make a living out of it. Um, I started doing a lot of private lessons and camps and gave up on the physical therapy. And that led me to to work part-time at a really unbelievable Division II school on Long Island called uh, CW Post. It was a Long Island University branch. And then the same week that Carol Drohan, who's the associate head coach at Northwestern, she formerly was at Hofstra. She left to coach with her sister at Northwestern. I got the job at Hofstra um, exactly that same week. But uh, it was one of those things that, you know, I knew it was my passion. I knew I absolutely loved the game. I knew I was always going to be around the game. But when one path led down to another, I realized that I could actually make a living off of it. And how about the distinction between being an assistant and then getting that first opportunity as a head coach? Was that something, A, that you aspired to do? And B, at the time you got that position, do you think you were ready for the head coaching position? I definitely was ready when I took over the program. I mean, I was an assistant for 13 years, 
But, you know, an interesting story. After I was at CW Post for one year, a very successful Wonder Conference Championship, went to the NCAAs. Um, I shot out my resume to about six or seven different Division I schools. And I just wanted to see if what I had on paper and the success I had on paper was good enough to get an interview. And that's really all I, I sat out to do. Okay. Um, and I got a bunch of calls back and I, I got some rejection letters that I still have, but I did get a couple <laughs> calls back. And it was analyzing, is this going to be the next step to where I want to go? And I was given some jobs. But looking at, at the programs and the longevity of the program, it wasn't the right step at the right moment. I knew I had more to learn. Um, I wanted to be a part of the Division II program again uh, to be successful, to win, because um, winning teaches you a lot of the things. And I didn't want to take a job that I was going to be hired to be fired because it didn't have the resources and the ability to be able to be successful. Um, and Hofstra was the right job for me to take, so that was going to be my next step. And then I kind of went through that same process again. I was there five or six years. I had opportunities to go on to some other bigger programs, but I just didn't feel it was the right time for me to move. I wanted to learn as much as I possibly could under Bill Edwards. We were a very, very successful program. So we were able to coach our players up. We were at the mid-major level and we were going out and beating a lot of power five schools. So that in itself really taught me a lot about this game and what I needed to do in order to be successful um, and then I, I absolutely love the opportunity I had under Coach Edwards, and I really wanted to take over his program when he retired. And I knew it was just going to be it was going to be a matter of time. Uh, working with my athletic director at the time, we set up a, a contract that I was going to be the next head coach. So I knew I had that door open when it was time to come. Um, so when he did take over, I was completely so honored. There there wasn't a lot of transition because I had been in that program for so long. So it was kind of just the same message, but just a different voice speaking at the time. And then after coaching there for four years and we won two conference championships in those four years, I knew, and any time a mid-major program does well and is successful, athletic directors are going to come after the, those coaches sure. because they're overachievers. Mm -hmm. So I knew going into that year that it was going to be a decision time for me. I was either going to have to make a decision that I was going to be staying at Hofstra um, maybe for the rest of my life, or it was going to be time for me to move on to a, to a different level, to a different program to challenge myself. Um, it was just a matter of, are the, are the phone calls going to be ringing? Are there going to be opportunities at other schools? And as soon as we finished NCAA regionals that year, that Monday morning, the phone was ringing off the hook with a lot of different power five offers. And it was me making a decision on what is going to be the next step for me. Before we dive a little bit deeper into maybe some of the more coaching specific philosophies and just your overall coaching style, I think to maybe tie that up together with what you just said. So you make this decision to go to Mizzou and to be the head coach there. Meanwhile, your husband, as you mentioned earlier, is the manager for the Auburn Double Days, an affiliate of the Washington Nationals. So you're both involved in sports. You're both involved in a crazy, I'm sure, travel schedule normally, a uh, crazy travel schedule, and just so many different things because you're not only involved in sports, but you're both in leadership positions. You're both the top dogs, if you will, of your programs. And I'm wondering from a personal perspective, and obviously you don't have to share too deep of details, but how do you make the relationship work when one of you is in Mizzou, the other is in Auburn and central New York, and, and you just got so many different moving pieces going on? How do you keep that relationship strong? Uh, we're both, both very, very passionate about what we do. Um, and when we first met each other and then eventually got married, it was the discussion on, you know, we're going to follow whoever's career is most successful. Because at the time, we were both very young assistants. Um, and they both took off at exactly the same time. The same week that I ended up at Hofstra, he got a job as a hitting instructor in the Kansas City Royals organization. So it wasn't one of those where we had to pick one side or the other. Um, the seasons match up perfectly. Sure. He's gone from spring training the end of February until Labor Day weekend. And that's my season too. So we're able to fully indulge ourselves in our careers, give 100% while supporting each other 100%. And then in our off season, we're back home and we have your typical married life, <laughs> you know, couple <laughs> thing with, with yard work and, and stuff like that. <laughs> 
but we're able to really bounce ideas off of one another. I learned so much from him from a recruiting standpoint, because when he was an assistant at Hofstra, and this is back, you're making phone calls every single week, and, and recruiting was completely different, just listening to those conversations and how he was able to be so efficient and proficient at what he did helped prepare me for when I was in that role. But, you know, I couldn't ask for a better mentor that I have every single day. And, you know, not only the skill work, um, you know, being able to talk about, you know, picking up ground balls and hitting and catching and things like that, but in managing players and people and and young adults in today's day and age. Yeah, I think that's so cool that your mentor for so many different things is not only your husband, but probably someone who's your best friend and you can just bounce ideas off and just know that you're getting, you're getting the information that you need to be successful. However it is that you define that and you've both been able to share in that and help each other. And I think that's so cool and obviously unique in a little bit of a sense too. It is. And, and it's, I'm very fortunate because it's almost like a military lifestyle where sure. every single year the nationals could place them at a different level. Mm-hmm. So our home base could be anywhere around the country. So when the opportunity came up at the university of Missouri, it was, okay, do we want to live in Columbia, Missouri? Because he can live anywhere. You know, he's going to be in Auburn, New York this season. He was in Hagerstown, Maryland last season. Spring training is in West Palm beach, Florida. So he's constantly traveling. It's just where do we want to spend our off season and what's going to be the best for him and I. Yeah, very, very cool. And I'm curious if you can take us into, you mentioned the recruiting and I think what goes into that is a little bit more detailed and deep than it is just to say like, oh, I want to go to the University of Missouri, for example. I want to play softball for Coach Anderson. There's a relationship building aspect and it seems like you've picked up a lot of clues from your husband. And I'm wondering if you can just share what some of the the methods and the way that you go about recruiting and how you want to cultivate those relationships with players that eventually become high school players that eventually become your players. Absolutely. And it starts with having a philosophy. You have to know what type of player you're looking for, what you can teach, what you can't teach, and really what, what product do you want to be able to bring in? Because there's, there's a lot of coaches around the country that can and cannot teach certain aspects of the game. There's things that you can and cannot change with an athlete. You know, for example, in softball, if someone comes in and she's 18 years old and she's been doing something incorrectly or might not have the the DNA skill set to do a certain skill, I can't change her when she gets to me. I can't change if someone is a a pusher when they throw um, or someone has very, very slow foot speed and is running home to first in four and a half seconds rather than two and a half seconds, I can't get them to run faster. I can make them a little bit better, but I can't take a, a slow trot horse and make them all of a sudden a thoroughbred. You see what I'm saying? Sure. Um, the same thing with, with someone who's overhand throwing and has been throwing incorrectly for 15 years, I can't be able to change that in three months. So I have to know what I can and can't teach. I have to know what my philosophy is and if I'm going to recruit upside potential or do I want it to, to have the finished product and what do my assistants, what are they able to teach? So a lot goes into knowing as a coach what you're looking for to begin with. Um, what are your, your un- uncompromising issues going to be and what are your compromising issues? Um, for me, I want to make sure I'm recruiting upside potential because I love teaching this game. I love getting players better. And we're going to work really, really hard at it. So if you are the type of player that you already think you're the finished product and don't have great work ethic, but you might be a great softball player, it's going to be really hard to play for me because Mm -hmm. we work so hard. And I'm going to continue to instill that work ethic and that demand and those standards all the time, regardless how good you are. Um, If you look at me in the eye and you say, coach, I will do anything you want me to do. I'm going to outwork the system. You're my type of player. And I have to know that going in. So when I'm going through the recruiting process, I'm trying to figure out how competitive this young lady is. And back in the day when recruiting was happening very, very early, it was very hard to get that read out of eighth and ninth graders. They don't really know how competitive they are yet. (laughs) They don't know what their work ethic is. Right. So now I can have those conversations with someone who might be a little bit more mature to be able to figure out if it's going to be the right fit into our program. But if you don't have a clear-cut philosophy and standard, 
now you're starting to make decisions and maybe some poor decisions on some players because you really don't know what you're looking for. Yeah, and there's a lot of really interesting points that you just brought up there. And I think one of the first ones I'd like to dive a little bit deeper into is building that philosophy. So, for example, let's go back two years ago when you first come to to the University of Missouri and you want to put your stamp on the program. Maybe there are things that you're taking from the program's past and combining it with your experience at Hofstra or anywhere else that you're getting influence from. How does that process work like from the very start? How involved are other people like your assistants or even your current players that you are inheriting to make the philosophy that you have now two and a half years later? So the the first thing I said, and I said this in my press conference when I got the job, and it was in the first meeting I had with my team, nobody is going to outwork Mizzou softball. Nobody. So if I'm continually sending that message and backing it up with work ethic, then the players start to believe in how hard they're working. So when they take step, they go out on the field, they're going to refuse to lose because they, they know they've worked harder than anybody else. So that's really the number one message all the time. We're going to continually work hard. And when you work hard and you have a great work ethic, now all of a sudden you're developing some pride in what you're doing. You, you take ownership of what you're doing. You take ownership of the program. You take ownership of your teammates because you know your teammates are working hard. You're going to continue to work hard for your teammates. So you're developing all these intangible characteristics that then will carry over to the success of the field. So that was the number one thing that the message I continually say is no one is going to work harder than us. The second thing is we had to realize that we don't have the same talent that Oklahoma and Alabama and Florida have right now. It's uh, that's plain and simple. And some coaches might be afraid to say that because they feel like they might be putting down the players, but we don't, we didn't have the same talent that they did. So if you don't have the same talent, how are you going to beat them? You're going to outwork them. So we continually to try to push the fact that, that yes, they might have more talent than us, but they're not going to work harder than us. So we are going to work harder to be able to beat them in their game. Just to extend that a little bit further. So obviously you have, this really great ability to build a culture and to build a philosophy that is an environment that you want it to be as it is, but also an environment that's inviting for your players and for your assistant and for the parents and families of everyone involved. And I read something when I was doing my research earlier that one of the reasons you got hired at Mizzou was basically for that reason. It was your ability to change the culture of a program in a short time that press release I read was a big reason why you got hired. And whether you agree with that or not, what I'm wondering is, did you come into a program where you felt like there were some gaps that you needed to fill in? And was that something that you know made you step back and say, wow, this is going to be a little bit more difficult? Like once you started doing it and maybe you thought coming in, it was going to be, oh, we'll just fix this and we'll fix that. And then you ran into some more resistance. Was, was there anything around any of that that presented a challenge for you? So I'll start from the beginning. Yes, I was hired in, in the interview process. Jim Sturker, athletic director, he said, I want you to come in and I want you to build a culture. We have we have good players um, that are very talented, but I want you to build a culture and I want you to build a family atmosphere. And I know how to do that. We had that at Hofstra. I mean, I've been there 17 years. You have such a great history and tradition within the program. And the players appreciate the opportunity that they had. And that's the same exact feeling and atmosphere I wanted to be able to create at Mizzou. So when I, when I came to Mizzou, the first thing I did is I just listened to the players and I talked to them about why did they come to Mizzou? What, what was the reasoning why they wanted to be here? What did they feel that they lacked? And they had such great players and there was such great competition within the team and within the players, but then it creates a divide. And the previous coaching staff before me was very, very successful. And I will never, ever take anything away from the, from the respect and, and the past and the history of this program because they won. Um, but I needed to figure out why they won because they, they had great players. They were very successful. They bought into what the philosophy was at that time. So I had to be able to learn what was the reasoning why they won. But then at the same time, what's the reason why they did it in the last couple of years? And the reason why they did it in the last couple of years is because they had a lot of distractions. 
There was a lot of issues going on. There was NCAA investigations. They weren't buying into the philosophy of the program anymore. So I had to get them to buy into whatever my philosophy was going to be. It, it's all about buy-in. Um, so it worked for the previous staff, and I needed to make sure it was going to work for me. So carrying that into the program, it was getting them to understand why we needed to be successful. And I had to be able to explain to them some of my history. I was at a mid-major school in the Northeast, not a hotbed for softball at all. But why was Hofstra able to win? Hofstra was able to go out and beat Power 5 schools and beat the UCLA's and the, and the Missouri's and so on and so forth because we had an unbelievable work ethic. We were very, very determined. We were very self-disciplined. So I had to take those intangibles and get the Mizzou players to understand we are going to have the same philosophy, the same work ethic, where we're going to coach you the same, but now we're going to take SEC talented players and we're going to coach you up to be even better. So once they started to see the results and the buy-in and the understanding that you had to do all these little things, you had to be disciplined on and off the field in order to be successful, now I got them. Now I got the players that really want to be a part of this. They want to be a part of this work ethic, this, this philosophy, this standard. And now you can see the success that they're having. It's not for everybody. And I don't want it to be for everybody. There's players that, that don't buy in, that don't have that same work ethic and that determination, and they really don't belong here. And that's okay. And I don't want it to be for everybody. Um, so there were pro players that left the program the year before I got here, that summer before, and also this past summer. And again, that's totally fine because I only want the players in this program that really want to be here, that buy into the philosophy and the work ethic. And it's getting them to understand all those intangibles that you need in order to be successful. Great teams are disciplined and you can't pick and choose when you want to be disciplined. You can't say, well, I'm only going to be disciplined in the game. You have to be disciplined in every aspect of your life, on and off the field, in the classroom, how you conduct yourself, in practice, in the locker room. You have to maintain that same discipline so that when you take the field in a game, it's going to automatically happen. Oh, wow. I love so much, so much about that. <laughs> I'm like frantically writing notes Thank down you. right now that I'm, I'm trying to get as much in as we can here. Thanks. Oh. <laughs> it's good stuff. It really is. It is. Once, once you get it, it's tough. For, it's tough for kids. I get that. And to try to convince an 18 year old who's been very successful up to her point in her life that she might have to change some things and it's not changing drastically. I'm not trying to make you a different softball player. I'm just trying to make you a little bit more pay attention to some of the more details because when, when the game is on the line and you're in a pressure situation, if you haven't practiced those little things the right way, you can't go back and rely on them. Mm -hmm. And my whole philosophy is to teach you lifetime lessons that are going to make you successful after you graduate from the zoo. And if you do all those little things the right way throughout the course of your career, then life is a little bit easier. And we're going through a pandemic right now with the coronavirus. And I see, I see the social media with all these other teams all around the country that are really having a hard time with this adversity. Sure. My kids, it's like no big deal because we <laughs> have faced so much adversity in the last two years with their three coaching changes, with the NCAA sanctions, with so much adversity that we've had where now it's like, hey, guys, guess what? You got to go home. We're going to have to take online classes. I'm here for you. Let me know what you need. We get it. And we've, we've faced a lot worse. So now they're not, they're not panicking the way some other kids across the country are panicking because they don't know what to do with adversity. Hey, everyone. Christine here from Sweat with Stods, one of this show's sponsors. The Dynamic Leaders Podcast is here to help you be a better leader. And the best leaders take care of themselves both mentally and physically. I'm here to help on the physical side by making fitness accessible to everyone. As a certified personal trainer with years of experience coaching fitness classes, I've designed programs that can be followed at home and in the gym. These are intelligently structured programs, giving you a plan to follow to help you be successful. Build strength with my Get Strong at Home program, get quick results with Hit at Home 1 or 2, or work on your health outside of fitness with my Healthy Habits program. As a listener, you can get these programs at a discounted rate by entering code DYNAMIC at checkout. That's D-Y-N-A-M-I-C at checkout. So head on over to sweatwithstods.com, that's sweat with S-T-O-D-D-S.com to take the next step toward achieving your health and fitness goals today.
to that point of adversity. And I, I'm of a believer that, and I don't ever want to wish anything negative on somebody, but do you almost in a way as a coach want your team to go through, like, would you create moments of adversity just to see how your team could react? Like maybe not something as, as serious as like an NCAA investigation or something like that, but maybe some type of on field, you know, you, you have this plan a and and you got to go to plan F uh, because nothing is working in between. <laughs> Uh, that makes me chuckle because I never wish an NCAA investigation upon anybody. <laughs> right. um, but uh, yes, and, and my job is to make is create very, very tough practices to see how they handle that adversity. So when a game, they're prepared. Everything that they're going to go through in life is, is going to be a challenge. And we're going to have tougher struggles at times and, and some easier ones. And I'm, I'm here to help them through that, to prepare them for, for those challenges that they're going to have in their actual life. So, yes, I do think it's a coach's responsibility to, be, to teach them those things, to be able to overcome that adversity. We have an emergency action plan. So the same way, you know, the, the country right now is going through an emergency action plan and, and on campuses they're going through one, we have one win our program. And that could be from a rain delay to someone's glove broke to a shoe lake. So you think about all these different things that could stress an athlete out. And the first time I did this with a team, I said, I want you to write down in your notebooks everything that could happen that's going to freak you out in the course of a game. <laughs> and literally, like, 20 minutes later, they're still writing. And I just was like, guys, stop. Like, it's not that big of a deal. Like, there can't be that much that's going to upset you throughout the course of a game. It's going to work out. It's going to it's gonna be okay. So when we're in practice, there's times that I will, sit, I will just stop practice in the middle of practice, and I'll go, okay, it's a rain delay. Everybody in the dugout right now. And it could be bright blue sky, but I have to practice to prepare for that moment. Sure. So we're going to go sit in the dugout. We're going to sit in there for 30 minutes because there was a lightning strike. But I have to now keep them focused because if, when we take the field after that lightning delay, we have to be able to execute what we need to do. The same thing happens with an injury. You have an injury on the field. Everybody feels absolutely terrible for that player. You're devastated. You're heartbroken. How do you then respond? So if something happens in the course of the game, or in a practice that you can feel the energy just got sucked out of practice. That's a teaching moment. And it's to teach those players, Hey, this is going to happen in the course of the game. You're playing the highest level of division one athletics. People are going to get hurt. Things are going to happen. How do we respond? We care for them at the moment. And then we have to maybe immediately get back to work and execute our plan and do our job. So it's teaching them that same discipline and to be able to overcome those little adversities so now when they're they're going through the course of an everyday routine, they're prepared for that moment. This is so interesting. And I don't know how familiar you are with Major League Baseball in general outside of the Nationals maybe, but it I've never heard a coach say that they practice rain delays and like in practice, what are you going to do? You're going to sit in the dugout and then you have to come out and play a game once the rain goes by. And it's reminding me of the 2016 World Series when the Indians took the lead in game seven right before this rain delay. And then they come out of the rain delay so flat, the Cubs come back, win the World Series and the and the curse and everything. And it's like, you have to be prepared for moments like that. And I don't think as many coaches out there would, would be able to say that they do the types of things that you just described to us. And, and I would bet you a lot don't. And I just got the goosebumps listening to that story because in 2015, we won the uh, our conference championship after a rain delay. It was exactly the same wow. thing. It was a lightning delay. We were in the locker room. It was, guys, we practiced this a ton of time. We we're going to take the field in 30 minutes. We got to be ready to go. And we were. I mean, we came out, and you could see the difference between the two teams on who was prepared for that moment and who wasn't. What an advantage to have in that moment. And it's so clear to me that you believe so strongly in the philosophies that you have outlined for us today and articulate it to us. And I'm wondering how important though it is for you to get that same passion from on-field player leaders. Like how important is it for you to connect those dots between what your vision is and how the players conduct themselves, maybe in the presence of you, but not you know, relying on you so much to, to nudge them along or even off the field when you can't be around them because you have certain restrictions with the NCAA. So when I start seeing 
my messages carried out through my players and I start hearing them say the same messages to their teammates, now I know who's really stepping up and who's becoming a leader within the team. But it's also education where early on in the year, I, I will talk to some of the upperclassmen, those who I think are, are true leaders that have those characteristics and those skills, who is very vocal within the team and, and likable because a leader has to be likable. Sure. That the players are starting to follow and explaining to them that the leaders are extension of the head coach, that they have to continually send the same messages because it can't be leaders are saying one thing and the head coach is saying another because we're not going to be on the same same page. Right. So just educating them in those aspects. And when I start to see that they're doing it on their own, now I know I'm developing a culture. Now I know that they're sending the same messages. And if they're doing it in front of me, I'm hoping that they're doing it behind me and in the locker room. But again, it's a whole teaching process. If I start to see that there's some different messages being sent and some of the things coming out of our, our leaders' mouths are not mirroring the same message that I'm sending, now we're going to have a conflict of interest, and that's when you start to have divide within your team. Um, something I did this year, I took this from John Wooden's Pyramid of Success. Uh, we created our own. It was our Mizzou softball culture pyramid. And this past summer, I went to one of my upperclassmen, who was a natural leader and, and people went to her all the time. I asked her, what do you want our team to look like? What type of image, what type of message do you want our team to be? What do you want it to us to stand for? And the word that she kept coming back with was family. We want to be a family. I sat on that for a little bit and I, I took a couple of weeks to think about, okay, they don't know what it means to really be a family and how you get to that point. And when you talk to the most successful teams and athletes around, doesn't matter what sport it is at what level, they always say, we are so close. We are so tight. You know, they, we had each other's back. Um, I knew I could trust my team. How do you get to that point? And it just doesn't happen. So I'm flying back from Tampa, attending the, the pitching summit in August. And I started to throw down words and I, I created this pyramid. And at the top of it, I have family. And that's, that's our ultimate goal was to get to that point. But I started to put down words that I knew the players at the time didn't really truly get the foundation to, to be able to lay that groundwork to get to that top point of that pyramid. Sure. So as I'm throwing out all these words and I'm talking to my assistant, we started to create our culture pyramid. And throughout the entire fall, this season, we, we talked about those words. I educated him. What is the actual definition of appreciation? What's the definition of buy-in? And at the end of practice, we would get around in a big circle, and I wanted them to talk to me about, give me examples that you witnessed someone else carrying out one of these characteristics. Could be to you, it could be to somebody else. It can't be about you, because in this generation we have right now, you know, we say it's the me generation, they'll talk about what they did. And if I didn't preface the rules for this exercise, they would have said, well, I picked up Susie's water bottle and gave it to her when she left it in the gym. But I don't want to hear about you. I want you to show me that you were somebody else doing one of these characteristics. So now they had to get outside of their own little bubble. And when we started it, it was really hard for them because they only ever thought about themselves. And towards the end of the fall season, it was like clockwork where these kids were saying, you know, I saw Susie went up to Sally and she was talking to her about, and it was everything that was external rather than them only internalizing some of these characteristics. One of the other questions that's percolating in my head right now, and maybe in other people's minds as well, is how do you take everything that we've just talked about for the last 20, 30 minutes or so when it comes to building a culture into identifying leaders, what's the connecting factor, the connecting factors towards that element and winning on the field, not to point out to say that winning is the ultimate prize, but winning affords you specifically the opportunity to continue to coach and to continue to influence these young women and help them for life after sports. So how do you connect the two? One is going to be maybe a little bit more physical. The other is more mental and non-physical elements. But there's got to be some connecting factors where it clicks because you could have the best culture in the world. But if you don't have the talent, if you don't have the work ethic and you're not winning games, then it probably doesn't matter, right? Right. And you're absolutely right. 
it's, it's trust of your preparation. So it's, it's the communication and it's controlling the things you can control, especially in our game, because you could have 15 hits and not score a run. You can have one hit at the right time and, and score a run and win the ball game. So you have no control over the result, but you do have control over your concentration, your effort, and your attention to detail. So when you continually send those messages and not focus on the results, and the teams that focus on the results will get too high and too low. They get caught up in the scoreboard, and you can't in our game. You, there is no clock. So all you can control is, is you trust your preparation. You trust your, your teammates, your left and your right. You give great effort all the time. And you make sure you stay disciplined to the task at hand. When you focus on those things, you're going to be more successful than you're not. And that's the we're going to play one pitch at a time mentality. And you hear people say that all the time, you know, play one pitch. But it is. In our game, one pitch is going to one person. It's a very, very individual sport sure. playing with a team concept. But if you're not prepared for that one pitch and you don't compete on that one pitch and you don't give great effort on that one pitch, you're going to fail. And if you fail more times than you're going to succeed, now you're going to lose the game. So you can't solely just focus on that end result. you got to trust exactly what you're doing, that you're prepared, that there isn't anything to get that someone's going to do that you haven't prepared for. You're going to give great effort and great concentration all the time. And you're going to outwork them. So if you have those things, then more often than not, you're going to be successful. One of the big themes, and I'll end my round of questions around coaching on this that I've heard you say repeatedly now, and it's something I feel like gets lost, at least maybe in the general population of our country, maybe not so much in athletics, although I'll let you be the decider of that. But we're talking about work ethic being maybe one of the biggest differentiators between success, however you define that and not. And I just, I, I get a lot of people who are, they, they just don't want to put in that work. And then I get people who say, well, you shouldn't work harder. You should work smarter. And yes, I get that. Be efficient. You know, don't, don't waste your time and everything. But I, I don't know. Is there, maybe it's because we both grew up in central New York and we've got those East coast uh, roots and, and a little bit more blue collar, but that work ethic just seems like a, a common theme that you keep coming back to. I think it's, you know, and I don't know if there's a difference now between then, you know, the hardest working people, will always be the most successful mm -hmm. um, because they're very, very driven. I think that's always been the case, but I don't think, I don't think everyone is aware and how hard you truly can work. It's, it is bringing into their attention where, you know, a 17, 18, 19 year old might think that they're working hard and you might be sitting back and go, I know you can work harder than that. Right. But really what is hard work? What does it actually look like? The, again, those are the intangibles. That's the bottom of my pyramid work ethic explaining to them, tell me exactly what does good work ethic look like. They'll give you a little, little cute generic words. Um, it looks like sweat. Well, what does that look like? Like, how do you get to that point? It looks like you're, you know, giving a lot of energy. Well, explain to me, what does it look like to give you a lot of energy? I need some physical, tangible things that, that I can see what great work ethic looks like. So now it's getting them to think on a whole different level so they can be more aware on what great work ethic looks like. And then when your team starts to actually work hard and they're doing some things, it's pointing out, hey, you just set a new standard. And you could take something as simple as a running test and say they have to run half gassers, which is the width of a football field. They're running it in 23 seconds. And then all of a sudden you put a consequence at the end and say, okay, I want everyone to make it under 20 seconds. Or you're going to have to do another one. And all of a sudden, your whole team makes it under 20 seconds. It's <laughs> right. pointing it out. Hey, guys, you just set a new standard. You just proved to me that everybody can make it under 20 seconds. So now it's like, oh, crap, Coach, you're right. You actually you just made <laughs> us work harder. So now they're understanding what good work ethic is. So now it's every single one has to be under 20 seconds. And then you challenge them, okay, let's see if everyone can get under 19. So now you're pushing them outside of their comfort zone to really get what it means to have great work ethic. And now can they do that when they're on their own? Can they do that when the coach isn't watching? But again, it's a, it's a long process. They don't know how hard they can work until they actually work hard. Wow. This has been so great. And I know people are going to be jazzed up after listening to this conversation. So Larissa, where can people find you on social media? Where can we learn more about the Missouri softball program? 
I'm all over social media. So first, you can follow uh, Mizzou Softball on Twitter. Uh, my handle is Coach Larissa A on Twitter. I'm on there all the time. I don't post what I'm eating for lunch. I do post <laughs> a lot of motivational tweets and, and articles and different things. Um, my whole goal is to try to make the world better one tweet at a time. Um, so I like to put a lot of stuff out there. So, yeah, personally, I like to put out a lot of motivational things, um, educational things. Um, and then same with Mizzou softball, that we, we do a lot to try to be able to influence softball and the athletic department and our community on, on what we're doing within the program. My, one, of my, one of my goals in taking over the program is I wanted people on the outside to get a feel that they are a part of our program day in and day out. I wanted them to get an inside look. I want them to know and feel what we are about and to really buy in, um, which is why our motto and our hashtag is own it. And it's accepting a responsibility for what we do on and off the field and really to own, own our process and own our program. So when you follow us on social media, you have a lot of opportunities to really get an inside look into our program. Awesome. I will throw all of that information into the show notes. People that do want to follow along, I highly encourage it. It's been great following you on Twitter since we first connected and it's going to be great here in the future as well. But Larissa, before I let you go, the show is called Dynamic Leaders and you have showcased today why you are a dynamic leader and why you are on this show in so many different ways. And I thank you so much for that. But I do love to give my guests an opportunity to shout out someone in their own life who's been really influential from a leadership perspective or just in general, somebody that's been influential. Do you have somebody that you'd like to give a quick shout out to? I'm here where, where I am because of Bill Edwards, um, head coach at Hofstra University for 25 years, um, taught me so much and, and such an unbelievable mentor and teacher of this game really taught me so much about, you know, the, the little things and how the little things matter and the discipline and being able to outcoach your opponent. But his number one message to me, and I actually tweeted this the other day through the NFCA, was you share in your players' failures just as much as you share in their success. And so many coaches, when he said that to me, I thought, I thought about so many coaches when the player succeeds – the coach is all rah rah and, and on board, and yeah, you've been listening to me, and we got you better. And then when they fail, they always have a tendency to yell at them and be mad at them and, and treat them unfairly. And when he said, "You share in someone's failures just as much as you share in your success," and if someone's working hard and they just happen to fail, you have to feel with them. You have to put your arm around them and. Let them know that you you feel their pain, that you're going to figure it out together. And when you do those things, you're never, ever going to lose your team. Your players are going to trust you, and they're really, really going to buy in because they know that you're with them all the time. The next person I want to say that had a huge influence on me was my dad. Um, unfortunately, I lost my dad three days after I got the job at the University of Missouri. Um, he did know I accepted the job, but then unfortunately left this world. So he had such a huge influence on me. And... The message he sent to me growing up was, you don't like it, work harder. And he never, ever allowed me to complain. And anytime I I would mention something that I did like, he would just say, you don't like it, we'll work harder. Work harder than them next time. Um, So that's that's another message that I continually will say. And that's why we have the no one is going to work harder than us mentality. Those are two amazing shout outs and just an awesome way to end what's been a really incredible conversation. And I can't. Thank you enough, Larissa, for taking the time to do this and share everything that you did. I'm, Like I said, I'm really jazzed up. I know people are going to be when they get a chance to listen to this too. But thank you again so much for taking the time to hop on the show. This was awesome. I appreciate it.